Here in the heart of the island of Newfoundland, nestling at the mouth of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, lies its caribou country, stretching away mile after mile through fields, lake and forest. Let's join Lee Wolf, internationally famous sportsman at a wilderness camp, where he and Jim John, one of the province's most famous guides, are topping off preparations for a caribou hunt with a typical Newfoundland mug up. They travel the high and fairly open country in search of game and watch a flock of Canada geese fly away in an easy climb. It is September and the young geese of this brood have grown large and strong, almost ready for the long migration that will soon take them far to the south for the winter. Heavy from their rich feeding of berries at this season, geese too are appetizing and satisfying game. But the interest of this hunt is centered on seeking out a big caribou stag. And somewhere out on the high rolling country, beneath the flying geese, the hunter is sure to find one. At another point, they pause to watch a red fox one of nature's craftiest animals race away in wild alarm, surprised by the hunter, whose gun will remain silent, however, until he finds the special game he is seeking. The presence of foxes also indicates a plentiful supply of snowshoe rabbits and other small game. Traveling over a ridge, Lee and Jim lift their eyes to watch a young bald eagle soar above them on the six-foot spread of its broad wings. Entering a small glade in the forest, a sudden movement draws their eyes. These are female caribou, or does. Does sometimes have small horns that differ in shape from those of a stag. And the doe also lacks the distinctive white neck ruff worn by the male at this season. These does take little alarm at the first men they have ever seen and move off unhurriedly. Later on, while crossing an open field, a caribou stag comes into view. The showy white fur around his neck quickly identifies this animal as a male. But a study of his antlers through the binoculars shows him to be a young stag whose horns lack the majesty they will attain when he is fully grown. This young caribou stag, whose stakes would be prime and tender, swings on around the hunters to a downward position. Spared because his antlers failed to measure up to the requirements of this discriminating hunter, he becomes one of the few stags ever to stand out in the open and watch a hunter turn his back and walk away. Although caribou hunting may be quite successful when the hunter is on the move, Lee and Jim both know their chances are best if they spend most of their time at a few good lookouts. It is from one of these vantage points that a caribou is spotted, moving slowly across the open slope at a distance of more than a thousand yards. The animal is easily identified as a stag by the white of his neck and the occasional flash of the sun on his horns. Knowing the country as well as a small boy knows his own backyard, Jim John, the guide, is able to sense the caribou's destination and guess his probable course. Out of sight and downwind from the animal, he and his hunter travel swiftly, but not swiftly enough to reach the first possible point of interception before the caribou has crossed that particular ridge. And again, the hunter and his guide take off on a course designed to bring them to a point on the caribou's path well in advance of his arrival. This fully grown caribou stag, sleek and beautiful, weighs nearly 400 pounds and carries a truly impressive set of antlers, a splendid trophy and a bountiful supply of fine wild meat. Setting his sights at 200 yards, Lee brings the gun to his shoulder. 
the caribou, now out in the open, tests the wind for danger. When the aim is perfect, the shot drops the stag in his tracks. Hunting is the regulated harvesting of Newfoundland's game crop, designed to give the greatest return in sport as well as in meat, something that is particularly valuable in a province where few domestic animals are raised for slaughter. A good shot and a clean kill. Jim skins the cape for mounting and prepares the meat for the carry back to camp. On the first trip out, Lee carries the head while Jim shoulders about a third of the meat in a pack improvised from the hide of the caribou. The remaining meat is left at the kill until a second trip can be made to carry it all back to camp. None of it will be wasted. Now Lee Wolf exchanges his rifle for a shotgun. And from caribou hunting, he turns his attention to the great game bird of the northern barrens. These are ptarmigan, which the Newfoundlanders call partridge. They are the grouse of the north, and are similar to the ruffed grouse in size and shape, but these birds change their color with the seasons from a mottled gray bronze in summer to a complete snowy white in winter. The early hunting in October finds them already preparing for the coming of the snows, about midway in their plumage change. Ptarmigan hunting is done in open country, on the wild meadow, the barrens and the burned over areas, where it is easy to follow the movements of the setter as he covers the ground in his search for the scent of birds. Finding it, he moves up swiftly for the point. The setter holds steady while Lee walks up to take a shot as the bird goes to wing. and to complete a double for a second ptarmigan as it roars into flight from another quarter. The bird flights in this film are slowed to half speed. Actually, ptarmigan fly as fast as rough grouse or quail and are equally sporty. And now with the broad Atlantic sparkling in the sun behind him, Lee climbs the hills, for the ptarmigan, like the caribou, prefer the high and open country. Less wary than the big game animals, however, the Newfoundland ptarmigan are found in areas readily accessible by boat, train, or highway. Again, the setter finds the scent of game and carefully works up to a point. The birds flare into flight, and Lee shoots, ha oh, but right through a hole in the middle of the covey. And off they go, every last one of them, over the ridge and out of sight. Ptarmigan like these are often found in coveys of from 8 to 14 birds. But there's always a consolation to be found for a missed shot on this hunting ground. The tart red partridge berries, which cover much of the ptarmigan country, and the endless acres of blueberries furnish an occasional snack for the gunner. And these berries also form a major part of the diet of the birds and give them that special and unforgettable flavor. Meanwhile, the setter has located another covey and stands like a statue while he waits for Lee to come up, flush the birds and take the shot. Ahead of the dog, a single strutting partridge on lookout blends into the background foliage. But a moment later, when the birds go to wing, all the hidden white feathers that will match the winter snows flash into sight. And this time, Lee's aim is true, and each shot brings down a bird. Two more tasty ptarmigan are one step closer to the oven. Newfoundland's ptarmigan are great game birds, hunted in beautiful cover, where the gunner has excellent visibility and the dog has plenty of room to work.
Not all the island's gunning is confined to field and forest, however. There's exciting hunting to be had on the sea as well. Each summer brings great herds of pilot whales, better known to the natives as pothead whales, into Newfoundland's bays and coastal waters within easy cruising range for small power boats. For this sport, we go to sea in a 40-foot cabin cruiser. The lookout spots the whales and shouts, there they blow, a signal for the entire crew to go into action. Quickly the harpoon is made ready. It consists of a swordfish dart set on a steel shaft at the end of a 14-foot spruce pole and attached to a hundred fathoms of nine-thread manila rope. This equipment is normally used for the harpooning of swordfish, which average a few hundred pounds in weight. But it is very light gear for these pilot whales, whose weight is counted in tons instead of hundreds of pounds. The boat moves in slowly among the surfacing whales, seeking to reach a point within throwing distance of one of the larger ones. Here comes the opportunity, and Lee throws the harpoon, sinking it deep as the whale starts his dive. The harpoon pole comes free on its separate line, and the pilot whale threshes momentarily in a flurry of foam, while the skipper and crew keep vigilant watch, ready to turn and race out of the way should the frenzied whales smash toward them. Although these whales are small, as whales go, they are still possessed of amazing strength and power. The light equipment being used calls for alert and careful handling of both boat and harpoon line. When the whale sounds for a long, deep run, a buoy is thrown over to keep the end of the line afloat so that it can be picked up later at the end of any particular burst of speed which has been too swift for the boat to follow. Any holding back on the rope on one of these wild runs would snap it like a thread. The same type of playing that is used in landing a big game fish is required here to avoid breaking the line or pulling out the small dart. After several long runs, the pilot whale rejoins his herd. Now, enough pressure must be exerted on the rope to tire him further and pull him away from the others. Once separated from the rest of the herd, the harpooned whale can easily be identified, and Lee will try to finish him with a shot from the rifle. This is tricky shooting from the deck of a moving boat, for the target is a very small one, as only a brain or spine shot will be fatal. The bullet is struck, and the whale goes down. All hands to the line now, as the rope draws the whale in toward the boat. But the pilot whale was merely stunned by the bullet, and reviving, he starts off on another run while the flying coils of rope whip dangerously close as the line speeds through the hands that control it. It becomes obvious that at least one more bullet will be needed to subdue this heavy seagoing mammal. Now the shallow angle of the rope indicates the whale will soon come up again for breath. And as he breaks the surface, another slug strikes home. All whales are notoriously hard to kill. A bullet through fin or flesh has no immediate effect, and a bullet striking the water first loses its power to penetrate. Already two shots have gone into this whale's skull, yet it will take still another to finish him. This too is a period of danger when the pilot whale, held close by the rope, but still strong and unpredictable, may strike at the boat with a wild rush. If he does ram the boat, the force of the blow could easily sink her. Final shot, centering in the eye, ends the battle. The head of each pilot whale contains a store of very valuable oil. The blubber is used for various manufacturing processes, while the meat serves as food for nearby fur farms. This is a valuable catch. This is sport with a purpose. Now we go back to the wooded valleys, where Lee and a guide canoe quietly through the reflections of a smooth flowing river. This is moose country in the early fall. 
Paddle blades dip quietly among the lily pads that line the shallows. Lily pads whose stems and roots are one of the favorite foods of the moose. A calf moose swims across the river in advance of the canoe. This is just a baby moose, not yet six months old. Yet he weighs about 200 pounds and is already an accomplished swimmer. Approaching the shore, this young and frightened moose encounters some difficulty getting through the alders. When he gets his full growth, he'll be able to crash through them as if they were mere straws. Farther along the stream, a cow moose, mother of the calf, takes a quick look at the hunter and his guide before disappearing into the bush. Leaving the main stream for a winding channel, the hunter is more than ever alert, never knowing when a sudden turn may bring him face to face with a great bull moose. And he can never know how many moose stand watching, unseen, behind the stream's fringe of alders as they paddle by. At the head of the open water, Lee and his guide bring their canoe to shore in order to hunt the higher ground on foot. Moose were not native to Newfoundland, but were introduced in 1905. The island suited them well and they flourished. The evergreen forests with their scattering of birch, aspen and maple give protection from the winter storms and some subsistence feeding. The broad fields are rich in summer food and the moose travel the soft marshy ground with ease, though some spots may prove tough going for the hunter. Water and the rich growth of swampy shores are everywhere. This is wilderness hunting, where a man need not clothe himself in scarlet, and where any water he finds will be safe to drink. The Canada Jay is common to these northern forests. It has little fear of humans, and a few hours' time will usually tame one of these wild birds into a friendly camp companion. Hidden in the alders now, our hunter and his guide watch and wait as they hear a moose approaching. It turns out to be an old bull that has apparently suffered a serious injury some months before. Only one antler has developed, and that in a short and stubby growth. His gait is awkward and crippled. And although he is a big bull and legal game, he is no worthwhile trophy, and his meat would be tough and stringy. Lee holds his fire. Perhaps that moose was lucky after all. A dead tree standing alone offers a good view of the surrounding open country, and a full-grown moose like this one can be seen for a long distance. Here is a bull to quicken the hunter's heartbeats. Knowing the terrain thoroughly, the guide chooses the path as they cut through the alders to stalk the moose. But at the end of the stalk, the success or failure of the hunt depends upon the gunner himself. When there is just time for a single shot as the big bull breaks for the timber 150 yards away. The hunter's bullet is the most merciful death a game animal can hope for. Otherwise, he must eventually succumb to disease, predators or starvation. Rarely, if ever, does he die of old age. Lee uses caution in approaching this bull, which weighs in the neighborhood of a thousand pounds. A single well-placed shot has brought down a magnificent trophy and harvested many hundreds of pounds of choice meat. The massive head and some of the meat come out on the first trip with the balance of the meat to be carried out later. A canoe trip, combined with either hunting or fishing, or both, makes an interesting vacation. The canoe travels silently and easily along the natural highways of the backcountry. Through intimate narrow channels, down broad stretches of quiet water, and safely through the deep runs amid tumbling white rapids that lead back to the base camp.
like Lee Wolf, most moose hunters can count on getting their game in Newfoundland and on bringing a good supply of meat back to camp where it may be brined and lightly smoked if the trip home or to adequate refrigeration is to be a long one. They can look forward to choice moose steaks sizzling aromatically over a blazing wood fire and to returning home with an outstanding trophy from the province of Newfoundland where sport is at its finest.